Okay, let's begin. Hello, uh, my name is Elias Redstone. I'm the Artistic Director of Photo 2022 International Festival of Photography. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Great Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which I'm based today. Uh, I would like to extend my respect to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters across Australia. So we are here to talk about curating photographs. This is part of our programme at Photo 2022. That's a major international festival of photography taking place across Melbourne and sites in regional Victoria. The festival features 90 exhibitions celebrating the work of 123 artists, all responding to one epic theme, being human. And we look to, ex to explore all this today. So while this festival is on, uh, we wanted to bring together some of the curators who've been responsible for, for uh, curating exhibitions in response to this theme for the festival. And I'm delighted to be joined by four curators. So today we have with us uh, Shivanjani Lau, who is a Fijian Australian artist and curator. Her work explores personal grief to account for ancestral loss, exploring narratives of indenture and migratory histories from the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Um, she works across use uh, storytelling objects and video to account for lost histories and seed futures for healing. We are also joined by Pippa Milne, who's a writer and curator based in Melbourne. She's the senior curator at Monash Gallery of Art in Melbourne, and has been working with photography since 2011. She was previously curated at the Centre for Contemporary Photography, Melbourne, and Associate Curator of International Art at Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. Also with us is Cathy Pryor. Cathy is a curator and producer who's co-curated Helmut Newton in Focus at the Jewish Museum of Australia. The exhibition is a partnership with the Helmut Newton Foundation in Berlin, explores the life and career of one of the most influential fashion photographers of the 20th century. And finally, we have Brendan McCleary. Brendan is the curator at Photo 2022, and we'll be talking to some of the outdoor commissions that we have been that we are presenting across the city. So I'll be inviting everyone to uh, speak uh, one by one. Um, we will be starting with Pippa Milne. We will then be uh, introducing Shivanjani Lal, who will be talking about her exhibition at Footscray Community Arts. Then Kathy Pryor will be speaking to the exhibition uh, with Helmut Newton at the Jewish Museum. And finally, Brendan will be speaking about the outdoor programme. If anyone has any questions during this, uh, during this webinar, please do ask them using the Q&A function. I'll try to get through as many of these as possible. Ask them at any point during the talk and, um, and we'll um, put them to our esteemed panelists. So I will ask um, our curators to turn their screens off. I will then show a brief introduction to the festival and then I'll be inviting Pippa Mill back on to join us in just a minute. So before we begin, I thought I'd place this, all these exhibitions, all these talks about curated into the context of the festival in case you haven't had a chance to see what we are talking about. So this will just give you a brief visual um, introducing the festival program and what, people, what audiences here can expect to see. <laughs> So this is what Photo 2022 looks like. Now we will hear about all the hard work that goes on behind these exhibitions and the techniques and processes that curators employ to curate exhibitions of photography. So Pippa, I'll ask you to join us. Uh, Pippa will be speaking for 10 minutes. Uh, I will then come, on, come back and join you. Uh, but for now, Pippa, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Elias. 
Oh, lovely to be here um, today. I'm just going to share my screen so that I can show you a few install shots <clears throat> and tell you a bit more about how this project came to be. So as Elias mentioned, I'm here talking about the, um, the exhibition by Hoda Afshar at Monash Gallery of Art, Speak the Wind, um, which we, we have on alongside another exhibition, Old Ways, New Ways. Um, and Hoda's exhibition is the product of, of a long relationship that I've had with Hoda, um, a friendship and a professional relationship. And I thought it would be interesting to perhaps step back in time a little bit and talk about the way that this project has been talked about for many years, how we've worked together in the past, and then give you um, a practical background to how this program came together. So Speak the Wind is Monash Gallery of Arts luminary exhibition for this year, which denotes the idea that, that Hoda is a luminary artist within Australia's photography scene. Um, and it also notes that NGA has had a long relationship with Hoda. She has had um, works and exhibitions in the past. She's been um, the uh, winner of the Bones Photography Prize in 2018. But my, um, my knowledge and um, relationship with Hoda started many years ago. And we actually did our first project together in uh, 2016. So I wanted to show you these install shots of In the Exodus, I Love You More, which was a show that we did at uh, a small gallery called Bright Space. And this was an exhibition that took a large, large series of Hoda's work that looked to her homeland, to Iran, um, and to the idea of being estranged from that homeland and reflecting on what it meant to be separated from it. In the conversations that we had in the lead up to the 2016 show, we spoke really extensively about modes of presentation of photography. Hoda is, as I'm sure you are all well aware, an incredible photographer with an, an amazing eye and a, an amazing way of making photographs in order to tell stories. Our conversations therefore sort of revolved around the different ways of stepping from the frame, from making the images into the gallery space and what that, that transition really meant. And with that in mind, we sort of put together a lot of different chapters. This was a really vast body of work and had a lot of different material in it. And we wanted to step away from just photographs on the wall and step them out into the three-dimensional space. So you'll see that here we've got some photographs which you had to look down upon in order to see, um, and then others which stepped away from the gallery wall entirely and stood alone. Um, and then others still that were wallpapers and a series of archival photographs that were um, not archival photographs, they were photographs by Hoda of, um, of graves of, of the, um, the memorials to martyrs in Iran. But it was again, a way of separating them from the rest of the, the series of work. So from there, uh, 2016, we then, made another show together in 2017, which was very, very different. It was a single body of work. And this was at CCP when I was, when I was the curator there. Um, and this required a really different curatorial um, direction and a lot of different conversations about Hoda's work uh, and about the, the specific series. So this was a series of works made in a bathhouse a gay bathhouse in an undisclosed location. And there was um, a, a really distinct um, requirement by Hoda that this remained something that celebrated um, the, the, the relationships and processes that these men were going through and the, the, um, the way that they were living their lives, but didn't make it a spectacle. It wasn't about um, where this bathhouse was, whether it was illegal, all that sort of thing. It was about the, the candid beauty 
of what was going on here. So instead of being many, many different forms of photography and many different modes of presentation, we together paired it right, right back into um, a very perhaps more demure exhibition. Um, we had a lot of discussions about the size of images in this, in this iteration and about paint color and about a closed intimate space similar to a bathhouse. Um, and again, with Hoda's, both of Hoda's exhibitions uh, thus far, I've sort of kept a really minimal input in terms of curatorial texts. Um, the first one was, uh, instead of a curator's text, was a conversation with Nikos Papastigiadis, and in the second one was a short curatorial text. This takes us to Hoda and my third um, project together, which is Speak the Wind, currently at NGA. In this, I'm so amazed at Hoda. This is just an incredible exhibition, which is the product of so many years of her work. Um, but I want to step you through it through the, um, the virtual tour and give you an idea of this exhibition. So this exhibition came about through a, um, a long project that Hoda had been making in revisiting the islands in the Strait of Hormuz in Iran, in the south of Iran, um, quite a, an unpopular, an uncommercialized um, series of islands where there is a mysterious and intriguing belief that the winds can possess a person. And so we made this exhibition together after Hoda had already made a book. She made a book by the same name, Speak the Wind, published by Mac Publishing House in London. Um, and so there was already a very clear resolve by the artist as to what this body of work intended, um, how it was uh, <clears throat> to manifest in the world. And this idea of putting it into exhibition form was an opportunity to sort of break away from the book um, move away from the very distinct and um, very resolved uh, bodies and sequent bodies of, of images and sequences of images and pairings that she had put together. She was very unafraid of moving into completely different modes of presentation. So as you enter the space, uh, it's a large um, high ceiling space. We have sort of four main instances relations, let's say. We have this one wall, which is, I could call the wall of the wind. Um, and this is a series of images on washi paper pinned to the wall, very, very simply. Everything, absolutely everything in the exhibition is unglazed. There is no glass between the viewer and the, um, and the work, which is a big contrast to um, the initial work that we did at Brightspace, where you will notice that there are um, there are reflections there. So something that Hoda was very specific about was that she wanted this immediacy between the, art, um, the work and the viewer. So pinned works, framed works, and also um, these very beautiful and intriguing drawings of the wind by um, some of the people who she came in contact with during her time in these islands. And when I say during the time in these islands, um, this wasn't the product of her flying into these islands for one visit, making a body of photographs and then making a book and an exhibition about it. I think there have been maybe eight or so visits um, over uh, seven years. Um, she spent significant periods of time. And I know that for the first three visits or so, Hoda only made photographs of landscape and architecture. She made no portraits until she had fully got to know um, these people and been invited into the ceremonies and the, um, the processes that, um, that, these, that these people were, were living. Um, here we also have descriptions by the people of the, um, of the possessing wind in both English and Farsi. Um, in this space as well, we come sort of through a, a short curatorial text into, um, into this wall, a wall of portraits here. Uh, I call it a wall of portraits in a very sort of loose sense um, because 
these are portraits of the people that Hoda has encountered and spent time with, but they retain the mystery of these islands and of, of this whole um, sort of idea and set of ideas that Hoda's investigating. You never see a single face in this exhibition. There's always a turn away. There's always a sense of mystery. There's always covering up. And the stories are only told as you sort of really uh, begin to dig into them. We were very clear that we wanted to steer away from an anthropological view of this, um, of this group of islands and of the practices uh, undertaken there. And so um, rather than being straight documentary and rather than being um, didactic or explanatory in the photographs that she was making, these are sort of propositions, um, ideas that are, of, of photographing uh, a complex set of, um, of places and people and highlighting the beauty of them just seen Elias come back in, so I'm going to go fast right now. Um, <laughs> the third uh, curatorial sort of intervention that we made was to make these three monoliths, which um, we hoped would give people a chance to fall into the landscape of the wind and find the mystery of them, negotiate that space there. And then lastly, and I won't show you the video, but I would love it if as many people could come and see it. It is some of the most beautiful 18 minutes um, of video art that I've ever seen. Um, this is a, a video that sort of goes into the ceremonies of the islands here. Um, Elias, is that Thank you, that's minutes? absolutely yep. beautiful. I would suggest that everyone does go and see these exhibitions to fully immerse themselves and understand um, how these exhibitions kind of welcome in the audience and how people also move through the space and think about the ideas that you, you have discussed. Um, very briefly, uh, while uh, Shivanjani, if you want to come back on screen and get yourself ready, Pippa, I think it's really interesting how you've returned to the same artist a few times. There are obviously countless incredible photographers in the world. Why is it important for a curator to actually uh, return to, a, to an artist and, and uh, uh, create an exhibition with them again? Like, wh why, do you, why do you work with Hoda in different uh, contexts? Well, it's a good question because there are so many incredible artists and ideas and different directions to take curatorial projects in. Um, but there is some pleasure in, in diving slightly deeper each time with an artist, getting to know them and honing um, your curatorial ideas as they develop as well. And I think that artists are the last thing that they are is static um, and that their projects do tend to especially with an artist like Hoda, get better and better and better each time as they discover and, um, and sort of hone their ideas as well. So I return to artists, but, um, but also do try to keep a wide purview of what else there is out there to do. Pippa, thank you very much. We'll see you shortly for some questions. Okay, so now from um, Hoda Afshar's solo exhibition, Speak the Wind at Monash Gallery of Art, we are traveling west across the city to Footscray Community Art to hear about a group exhibition and the challenges um, involved in bringing different artists together uh, for an exhibition with a bell rings across the valley. Shivanjani, I'll hand over to you and I'll see you in 10 minutes. Um, thanks so much, uh, Elias and the team at Photo 2022. Um, so I'm just calling in from Darug country in Western Sydney. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, uh, I'm both like an artist and a curator. And I think uh, mostly I curate as a way to kind of, I, I don't curate often, but when I do, I'm trying to think about my community, but I'm also trying to think about ideas around visibility and also, I guess, like who gets to hold space. So last year I was approached by, um, Footscray Community Arts to curate a show for Photo 2022 with the theme being human. And uh, they wanted to focus on South Asia and I was super excited about this idea. I, I think um, the previous time I uh, curated, I melodramatically sort of decided that I was no longer gonna curate and then Footscray approached me and I was like, oh, actually I would really like to curate this show. So um, when they approached me, I very quickly 
sort of was looking at my own interest in South Asia. So in 2017 to 2018, I lived and worked in India, but also spent a long time in uh, Nepal as well as Bangladesh. And what I was really curious about were these relationships that photography had with contemporary art and also the relationships these um, photographers had with each other within the context of the region. Um, people have always talked very well about um, photo Kathmandu and uh, Chobi Mela, which is in uh, Bangladesh. And so I was really kind of interested in how to bring these like photographers to Australia, but also I guess um, how to kind of think about um, the relationships interpersonal within the context of the region. So as an artist, I think one of my beginning points is photography and and my dad is like my favorite photographer and he has this thing where he says you know to take a photo of a person you have to take it of their whole being like from the head to the toes and and also my dad is very literal so he actually means like from the head to the toes but what I think in this context he means is like an essence of a person and I think that's a very human experience or a very human um understanding of the world um so um I'm not quite sure what's happening. <laughs> um, so uh, when I was talking to Footscray Community Arts, um, we decided that we were not going to focus on one place in South Asia. We were going to sort of um, uh, think of it more broadly. So often when South Asia is thought of, it's usually thought of in the context of India and possibly Pakistan. But what I really wanted to talk about is that South Asia is much more than that. So it includes Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, the Maldives, Sri Lanka, and in my context, also Myanmar. And so this, for me, I wanted to really focus on the Bay of Bengal, in part because I was really interested in the relationships that that led into my own community. Um, and because uh, I'm Indo-Fijian, and I really also wanted to think about this idea of what it means to be diaspora. And so the title of the exhibition, A Bell Rings Across the Valley, sort of stems from this idea of bell ringing being a place of joy and alarm, but also like a resonance that connects a person from diaspora to the continent or the subcontinent in this case. So the images that I'm sharing with you are from the artists in the show. Um, this current artist is Shui Wutuman, who is from Myanmar. Um, when I approach them, and also, I'm sort of talking very fast because I'm feeling quite nervous. But um, one of the things about this show was that I had never worked with any of these artists before. I, I was familiar with them, but I didn't know any of them personally. And so I sort of cold called emailed five artists that I adored. So this artist is, uh, the artist on the screen right now is um, Indu Anthony and this body of work is called Cecilia and I'd been aware of this body of work for quite some time. It began on the internet, like on Instagram and um, followed the person Cecilia through sort of a daily photographic exercise. And the purpose of this, like the purpose of this work was about Indu Anthony sort of wanting to become or feel safer in public space after being violated in public space. And so C Cecilia becomes this avatar of like trying to reclaim or re-own public space in India. And I think that this understanding is a very human experience of, uh, of the world, of wanting to occupy and own it or feel safe within the context of it. Um, the second artist that I approached was uh, Shui Wutuman, who is from Myanmar. You can kind of see their work in the blue wall. Um, and Shui created this body of work examining mental health. Um, um, the body of work sort of examines her own experience of having a sister who has um, uh, schizophrenia and wanting to kind of uh, figure out her own relationship to what she needed in relationship to mental health. And so for me, like being able to ask these artists to come to it, like to have shows in Australia or like to have their first show in Australia was super exciting, but also like to um, examine the relationships between each other and sort of support them into creating work and quite ambitious work, I think, um, was really um, like a wonderful experience. And one of the things that I was also really excited about is, is that there are two commissions, but there are three um, sort of premieres in the exhibition. So um, this premiere, like the 
the, the other premiere in the show is um, Ashvika Rahman's work, which is Files of the Disappeared. And it's an ongoing body of work that looks at people who have been um, removed by the Bangladeshi police and given the opportunity to speak about their removal. Um, and I guess like one of the things that has been really curious about this exhibition is, is that um, sometimes when you curate a show, things can't bubble up to the surface, like they're very dif disparate artists, but all of a sudden you can see lines, links of language, links of like materiality, and it's really lovely to kind of think about the fact that, um, like, that even though these people are from different places, they still like uh, lines of connection or points of, um, like, curiosity that stretch across this this these lands and for me one of the other things that I was thinking about is uh like as as a as a brown woman like one of the things that I, I'm sort of seeking is like the opportunity to share representation and 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 also to think through think things through such as like who is allowed to be visible in 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 photographic spaces and for the most part I have often felt that that photography is such a boys club and so to be able to kind of provide and platform the opportunity for five South Asian women photographers was like a really really exciting to kind of manifest um, and one of the things that I was really also conscious of is that um, these are probably people who who are quite well known in like South Asia, but not so well known in Australia. And so like bringing, like trying to figure out how to navigate that space was really interesting, particularly in the, in the context of this pandemic. And so what we did was we had, um, like we were able to basically digitally produce, like ask for digital files and produce work here, as well as have things sent over. Um, one of the things that I was also really excited about was showcasing the work of Shilasha Rajbandri, which are these shawls. Um, and again, like one of the things that like I really wanted to push was this idea of what photo photography could look like, but also who was being photographed. Um, yeah, I think I rambled a little too much, but was there any questions, Elias? Or Shivanji, it's great. I think it's really interesting to talk about how photography exhibitions and ex exhibition making can be a political act. Yeah. I think that comes across really clearly in um, in the exhibition that you've uh, curated the Bell Rings Across the Valley and some of the curatorial decisions that you've made. It also shows kind of in contrast to Pippa, who's developed a um, <clears throat> an ongoing relationship with one artist, really understanding and unpacking their practice, that you can also reach out to people you've never worked with before, whose work who's yeah. work you admire and yeah. and have also different techniques to show photography. It doesn't necessarily have to be work that's framed or, or pinned to a wall. You can, you know, you can present photography on fabrics or as projections or as, or as different types of uh, different mediums which can be employed. So Shivanji, that sounds absolutely beautiful as an introduction. And I look forward to having some conversations with you shortly. All right. For now, I'll ask Kathy Pryor to join us. Um, the Photo 2022 Festival really is a celebration of contemporary photography, what's happening in the world of photography right now, what's coming next. But this year, we're really excited to introduce a new program, Strand. That is our icons, where we look back and celebrate some of the most influential and iconic figures in photography. And at the Jewish Museum, visitors will be able to experience the work of Helmut Newton. Kathy, I will hand over to you now to tell us more about putting this exhibition together and what it means to work with an archive, of a, a photographer's archive, as opposed to a contemporary living photographer. Over to you. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen. And... Uh... Okay, well, thank you so much for, for joining this, this webinar. I want to talk about Helmut Newton in Focus, which is part of Photo 2022 and is also on at the Jewish Museum until January next year. Um, I want to address, first of all, why the Jewish Museum decided to show Helmut Newton, why at the Jewish Museum of Australia. Um, it's important, of course, to have a premise and a set of aims um, from the outset. 
So Helmut Newton, as Elias mentioned, is one of the most influential photographers, was one of the most influential photographers of the, of the 20th century. His work in fashion and portraiture really pushed boundaries for its time and his legacy for the development of contemporary photography continues to be discussed today. Um, but as well as exploring his artistic legacy, our exhibition highlights a part of Newton's story that has not garnered international attention, his career in Australia as a fashion photographer in the late 40s and through to the early 1960s, because it was here in Melbourne that he opened a photographic studio at 353 Flinders Lane, and he spent two decades in Australia before he was internationally famous. So in curating this exhibition, we wanted to explore not just Newton's extraordinary photographic legacy, but also the arc of his life and influences. You can see here on the screen a couple of photographs that he took in Melbourne in the 1950s that are on display as part of our exhibition. So I wanted to give you a quick overview of his, of his life. He was born Helmut Neustadter in October 1920 in Berlin. He had a somewhat carefree childhood in Berlin, but in 1933, Hitler came to power and that changed the landscape completely for him and his family. In 1938, his father, Max, who was the owner of a button factory in Berlin, was arrested during Kristallnacht, which, was the, which were the pogroms unleashed by the Nazis against the Jewish population. And Max was only released one month later. Newton himself spent weeks in hiding before his mother secured him a ticket out of Berlin. So after a stint in Singapore, Helmut arrives in Australia on the Queen Mary, and like hundreds of so-called enemy aliens, he is interned at Tatura, a small country town, which is about two and a half hours from where we are here in, in Melbourne. Um, he joined the Australian Army in a Labor company before he's discharged in 1946. And 1946 is a critical year in his, in his life. He opens his photographic studio in Flinders Lane that year. He becomes an Australian citizen. And he also changes his name from Helmut Neustadter to Helmut Newton. So it's actually here in Australia that he becomes Helmut Newton in a way. Uh, two years later, he marries an Australian actress, June Brunel who in the 1970s would also become a photographer in her own right under the name Alice Springs. And that's a wonderful photograph of Helmut and June together in Sydney in 1955, taken by another well-known Australian photographer, Max Dupain. So you can see if it wasn't for his Jewish heritage, Helmut Newton may never have actually left Berlin and it's highly likely he never would have come to Australia. So I'm telling you this backstory because it's critical to the way we approached our exhibition. And I'll go into some of those details shortly. But before I do, I want to talk about working with an international partner, in this case, the Helmut Newton Foundation in Berlin. So the idea of that foundation was actually muted by Newton before his death in 2004. And it's charged with promoting his work and his legacy, as well as that of his wife, Alice Springs, who actually only died last year. So the Jewish Museum of Australia approached the foundation to be a partner in our exhibition and we we're lucky to secure 45 original Newton photographs, uh, which form his private property series that were taken between 1972 and 1983. Having more recent work on display alongside his earlier works from Australia was crucial to exploring his development as a photographer. Newton felt stymied by the social and sexual conservatism of 1950s Australia, and he was happy to leave it all behind once his star rose on the international stage. So juxtaposing his early work in Australia with his later work in, um, on the international stage provides a fascinating insight into Newton's artistic journey. You can see here on the screen, we've got on the left a portrait, a fashion portrait that was shot in 1950s Melbourne. And then we have the Sigourney Weaver shot on the, on the right hand side that uh, was taken many, many decades later in the 1980s. But you can certainly see those stylistic influences um, and parallels. So the private property series was chosen for our exhibition for a number of reasons. The thematic nature of the works illustrate Newton's interest in erotica, sexuality, fashion and fame. And there are stylistic and composition parallels between these works and some of his earlier works. We see the shapes of bodies, we, the, the use of hard lines and shadows, and a particular precision, precision for which Newton is, is renowned. 
Um, and these works also showcase some of his influences, including his early years in Berlin and the settings that inspired him. Grand hotels, night and dark of city streets, the red light districts, all of these influences Newton spoke about in his, in his career. So our exhibition is, was a little different to the way the Helmut Newton Foundation ordinarily operates. Usually they loan out a collection for a full hang, whereas we were proposing to showcase these works interspersed amongst other works and also archival material that um, spoke of his uh, life trajectory. Um, so there were discussions about how it would look and how it would feel and how his legacy would be represented, which was clearly important to the Helmut Newton Foundation. And it was also important from our perspective at the Jewish Museum of Australia that we would have the freedom to conduct programming alongside the exhibition to explore representation, gender, sexuality and power. So all these kinds of discussions are all talked about when you're partnering with another organisation. So once we'd established that all of those parameters had been fixed and, and discussed, um, it was a matter of doing a deep dive into Helmut's life in, in Australia in particular, and that's where my role really came in, into play. Um, one of the first steps in curating this exhibition was doing a wide sweep in the different institutions around Australia to find out what would be available for, for loans, and also to do archival searches to, to research his life in Australia and find people who knew him um, from, his, from his time here. Um, it was particularly challenging, actually, because um, this process for us started in June last year and by July, Melbourne, Sydney and Canberra were all back in extended COVID lockdown and access into archives and collections were, were very, was very difficult during that time. So we're very grateful for all the institutions who've assisted us in providing um, loan items because it really was a, a terrific group effort on everyone's part. Once the institutions opened up in November, we had a very tight deadline. Um, when you're curating uh, an exhibition about someone's life who um, is no longer with us, as Helmut Newton died in 2004, um, and you're also searching for aspects of his life that he didn't really talk about um, at much length, it can, it can be challenging. Um, some of the aspects of his Australian life were, were a bit, little bit difficult to, to pin down. And there was a lot of cross-referencing, preferably with contemporaneous archival material to, to really nut down, uh, nut out those, those details. So Helmut Newton in a way, uh, Helmut Newton in focus in a way is not a typical photographic exhibition in that we're exploring Newton's life story as much as we're exploring his photographic legacy. And my background is um, more in social history research um, than it is in photography per se, but it's fascinating to mirror these two narrative arcs in an exhibition space. Um, for example, as well as Newton's original photographs, we have archival material from the National Archives of Australia, including his German passport, which was stamped J for Jew. Um, we have newspaper clippings that you can see here on the screen. And one of my favourites is this newspaper clipping on the right, which it talks about the Newton's cat, Cecil, which was actually named after the British photographer Cecil Beaton. So it's these kinds of personal anecdotes that actually paint a picture of the man behind the lens, um, which was what we were um, trying to achieve in our, in our exhibition. I want to talk about exhibition design because that's obviously crucial from um, the point of view of, um, you know, a curator that you're working with, with a designer and um, working with a team of people that so we had our senior curator, we had our assistant curator, we had our production coordinator, our designer, uh, marketing and educations team, there's many, many people that make an exhibition um, uh, make an exhibition. Um, so Anna Trigloin was our designer and you can see on screen here um, a bird's eye view that Anna has done of our gallery space um, and some elevations uh, as well that show how some of the objects are displayed in the in the space. Um, so as the curatorial team is researching the objects and the, and the life story and the narrative arc, Anna is coming up with the concept design and how we're going to display these objects in the space and how we're going to tell Newton's story. So the concept is roughly chronological as we pass through Newton's life, the gradients of grey get progressively darker and the columns have a textured concrete feel which bring out that industrial gritty feel to Newton's world. Um, and we also spoke to sound designers about how they could bring, what they could bring to the space and John Shear used 1920s and 30s jazz to um, replicate Berlin. Um, and then we move into the 80s soundtrack. So this is our end result, this is our exhibition on display. You can see um, how the 
uh, paste ups, the wallpaper paste ups are contrasted with the original photographs that are framed. And you can see those gradients and the photograph on the left is the entry to the exhibition and we move through to the darkest part, parts of, of Newton's um, life. So that's an overview. I can see I'm getting the wrap up, so <laughs> I'll stop now. But that's an overview of our exhibition and how we approach the um, curatorial process. And I'll, I'll stop sharing, sharing my screen. Kathy, thank you so much. Brendan, if you can join us on the screen. Kathy, while Brendan's getting ready, just very, very quickly, you mentioned that you're showing obviously some original vintage photographs. Why is it important for you to show these? Why not just reproduce these? Uh, you know, why not make new prints? Yeah, well, listen, I think there is something um, quite important about the way that the photographer at the time would have um, uh, perceived these, these prints. A lot of photographers work with preferred printmakers as well, so that's important, um, particularly with the private property series. Um, Newton had a preferred um, printer. Um, in Australia, he, he did a bit of his own printing, but there were also people who worked with him in his studio. So there is something about the essence of a print that is from the time that is incredibly revealing about how the photographer wanted their, their prints to be shown. Absolutely. And printing techniques have obviously changed over time. Mm. So mm. Absolutely. Um, experience seeing a new print and a vintage print. Cathy, thank you. So we have just been taken through uh, three different approaches to exhibition making in galleries. Now we're gonna, we're gonna leave the white cube. We're gonna go outside and see what it means to um, curate exhibitions of photography in the public realm. Okay, Brendan, over to you and I'll be back in 10 minutes. No worries, thank you. Um, I'll try and stick to 10 minutes. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, so. I'm Brendan McClure, I'm the Associate Curator with the Festival and I predominantly look after um, artworks for urban activation and presenting artworks throughout the streets of Melbourne to complement and work with the exhibitions that we have in galleries. Uh, so for instance, this is Cindy Sherman presented on the facade of Fed Square while we have a show at the National Gallery of Victoria with Ashley Gilbertson and Gillian Waring at the Australian Centre for Moving Image, which are both just down through here. So the intentions of the outdoor activations really are to activate the city, but then also to complement and work alongside the indoor exhibitions that such as the ones that we've looked at today. So I'll just do a quick run through of some different styles of display for the outdoor program. So as you can see, we do a number of different styles of works, whether or not they're 2D pieces here. So that wall facades, um, construction hoardings. We've got a whole series of light box pieces down by the Birrung, the uh, Yarra River, um, working with the parks and the City of Melbourne team to present some works outside the Melbourne Town Hall and so on and so forth. So the outdoor program, we have 43 different artists that we've worked with, 19 of which are international, 24 of who are Australian. And we think it's really important as well with that, that we have some emerging artists in there, but then also the larger name artists mix in as well. For instance, Dana Claxton here is a leading Hunkapapa Lakota, which is a First Nations Canadian um, artist and professor at the university there. Um, Naomi Hobson is also an incredibly well-known artist, but then alongside that you have emerging Australian artists so that you can kind of see these conversations of how these artists can work together. So I thought what I would do is just to give a little sample of the outdoor program, just run through some of what we call our parliament precinct. So I'll just talk us through how we came to placing some of these artworks up along Spring Street. So the first I'm gonna speak about is Parliament Gardens. Um, so this is a site that actually has three different artists in here, Florian Hetz, which are the works over here, Alexandra Lethbridge, which we can see behind us, and Henry Wolfe in the center. So as I was just saying about presenting kind of a uh, um, more well-known artist alongside an emerging artist. Here we have Florian Hetz, and that, who is a German-based, uh, German Berlin-based artist, and Alexander Lethbridge, who is a British artist, who both um, have a pretty good international name to them now. And Henry Wolf is an emerging artist from Adelaide. So all of these works have kind of taken over the the park in Parliament Precinct, the Parliament Gardens, um, to look at the different ways in which our body is used as a space of communication and how we engage through the body. So starting with Florian Hetz's work is um, called Hot, which is German for skin. Um, it's a very tactile, very visceral 
piece that's very much honing in on the body to look at the ways in which um, we understand and look at forms. Um, with this work, we have quite deliberately placed it quite close to the fountain. So it has this kind of interaction with that site there. The work behind here, Alexandra Lethbridge's work, the archive of gesture is looking more at the ways in which different gestures create communication. So she's gone back to different images from antiquity. So these um, sculptures, and then also these shots from like the fifties and sixties of different forms of like, do this hand gesture to mean this. So looking at the ways in which our bodies communicate. Henry Wolfe's work, which we saw here together was a new commission that um, in a post COVID world um, was looking at the way that we come together and create friendships and community. So all three together kind of create this nice little synergy of talking to each other, but then also still have a bit of breathing room because it is a large park. So just across the road from the park, the Parliament Gardens, we've got the uh, Tianjin Gardens, which is, um, if you know where Tianjin is a city in mainland China. Um, it is the sister city of Melbourne and it's also the start of Chinatown. So we've worked with a Melbourne-based artist, Scotty So, to create these freestanding works called Shunge, which are looking at different Song and Ming dynasty folk tales that consider different forms of gender fluidity. Um, and so we worked closely with Scotty to work out a location for this. And Scotty was really excited about showing the works in a space that was culturally relevant for him. On the steps of parliament, so a different form of installation we've done here is a scaffold work where we've worked directly with Parliament of Victoria to present four different artists from a photojournalistic collective Oculi to show works from different gathering spaces in regional Victoria. Um, so we have here more kind of the two hero images which are staring down Burke Street. And then on the back, we have more of a kind of curated hang of the four different artists with the information on each artist on the side of the panel here. So we have James Bug Bush Dance, which is looking at different regional Victorian community dance halls. Rachel Mornsey, um, who is based in Mallacoota and Gippsland, and is particularly looking at that community post the bushfires and how they water has become such an important aspect of their lives there. Alana Holmberg, who Idle Hours is looking at different sites of recreation. This is a particular chapter that has also investigated water, but you can see in all of the images that everyone is kind of looking away or there's a sense of hesitation. Um, and a lot of Alana's work is looking into that changing conversation of our relationship to nature, particularly in considerations of climate change. And Abigail Varney on the right here, who's showing um, an unscripted recording, which is an archive of her father's photography from the 70s and 80s that she's unpacked and considered during lockdown. Across the, uh, just a little bit further down Spring Street, we have this work by Ivana Sakularaki, who is a Greek artist that's actually just moved to Melbourne. Um, this is called The Truth is in the Soil. And you can see these are kind of large freestanding banners, similar to the works in the Parliament Gardens that are investigating different professional mourning traditions in the Mani Peninsula, which is in um, mainland Greece, just down by the south. So this is from her photo book, The Truth is in the Soil. And there's something quite beautiful about getting what are usually quite small images that are quite intimate and then blowing them up to this scale so that you really come across and be um, they're like larger than human scale. Like if, if you were standing here, you'd get to about here on this. And there's this kind of presence that comes forth in the park when you when you work with these works. Across the road from Ioana Sakularaki, I have this work here by a Ghanaian born Sydney based artist, Richmond Kobla Dido called Men Do Not Cry. Um, so this is a work that we've worked with the building owners and the body corporate of this building 99 Spring Street um, to present this temporary work on the side of the wall. It's called Men Do Not Cry. And it's a body of work that was started with a poem by a friend of his, Ibrahim Intwari, that starts with a sentence, I come from a hood where men do not cry. I come from manhood. And it's very much looking at vulnerability and particularly vulnerability and care between men and specifically black men as well. So it's nice to consider that Ioana's work is just over here and is very much considering community care, professional mourning from a female perspective and Richmond's work over here kind of like 
balancing and talking alongside that work as well. The other work that you could see directly across the road from this, which is a really nice connection between the two pieces, is this installation by Atonga Tem, uh, who is a Melbourne-based artist. This is her latest commission, Surat, which is South Sudanese Arabic for snapshots or pictures. Um, and so this is a body of work that she's created where she's playing different characters from her family photo albums. So as you can see in that, there's lots of different ideas from different artists that kind of relate across them each other in the way that Abigail is using her own family photos as well, the way that Joanna and Richmond are looking at community care, similar to the Parliament Gardens as well. Brendan, thank you. That's a no great worries. place to end. <clears throat> I'll now ask all of the speakers to rejoin us. Um, and I'll just, as we're as people coming back on screen, just a reminder that these are just a small sample of the 90 exhibitions that are on display as part of Photo 2022. And anyone that might be interested in curating or learning about uh, curating uh, photography, probably the very best thing to do uh, as the start of your education is to go out and see as many photography exhibitions as possible. And they are all there for the taking at the moment. So I'm gonna, I've got a few questions. And um, if anyone in the audience watching this has some questions, please to use the Q&A function. Um, uh, I already see some questions coming in, so please do ask more and we will get to these shortly. My first question for, uh, for our panel, and feel free to jump in or, or uh, wave a hand if you'd like to speak or um, uh, just, just join the conversation, is just about stepping back and thinking, why are we exhibiting photographs? We see photography every day, hundreds, thousands of images. We're bombarded on Instagram and advertising, on the news. Everywhere we go, there's photography. Why uh, for you is it important to actually put photography into a gallery space, into an exhibition, or um, alternatively as um, outdoor artworks? So who would like to jump in first? Pippa, I may ask you to dive in seeing as you've made curating photography kind of a specialist subject for, for, your, for your profession. Sure, yeah, you're right. It is, it's everywhere and, um, and everyone's doing it. But there is actually, um, I think there's a lot to making good photography and to um, making interesting photography. That ubiquity actually sort of poses an even bigger challenge. And so curating photography means um, having this wide view of what's going on, but also thinking really carefully about why each time. Um, and I think that it's a medium that can speak to an incredible number of people and from an incredible number of points of view um, and sort of really, really dig into what's happening and why it's happening. Um, yeah, I could go on, but I'm sure other people have got more ideas. Um, for me, it's important to have this festival and to have all these exhibitions for people to pause and actually even think about the role that photography plays in their lives. Think about how artists and, and, and photographers are, are using this medium to say something about, about who we are today. Shivanjali, do you, would you like to add to the? Yeah, I, I just also feel like photography feels quite egalitarian, like in like a way that other mediums don't. Um, and also, like, I feel like because it comes from a place of documentary or documentation, it feels sort of untethered from types of history. Like, it feels like it's sort of actually generating history as it's sort of being produced. And so that feels really exciting. It means that people you don't expect will be taking photographs. Um, and certainly that's why I think, um, like, having photographic exhibitions are really important. Mm, kind of like it, it bears witness to a lot of what's going on. And then you can also, you can go down the road of social history and in that research or into other areas of art making and it leaves a lot of possibilities, doesn't it? It's As interesting. Yeah, I, was just gonna, I was just gonna say with Helmut Newton, it's interesting because he um, really 
uh, did an apprenticeship in photography. It was viewed as a trade um, and it was not an artistic pursuit for him for, for quite some time. And in fact, he railed against that notion that he was an artist and his photography was used in magazines primarily and, photo and advertising and it was a very utilitarian kind of um, craft. I mean, later in life, he certainly um, did exhibitions and that there was a change in that and that thinking, but it is interesting to think of photography through that lens as well as a as a um, as an industrial output, really. Mm, it's nice, actually, Kathy, you saying that that photography does have a utilitarian um, aspect, like large aspect to it, still in our society today. And I think because of that, it's a medium that has a lot more people have a um, visual um, visual literacy too. So it's something that people can understand, which goes back to what Shivantani was saying that it's more of an egalitarian medium because it's something that almost all people can look at a photo and create a meaning through it as well. Yeah, lots to think about that. Now, none of these exhibitions exist in a vacuum. They're all responding to Photo 2022's theme being human. Um, of course, anyone can curate an exhibition of photography at any time, but what does it mean to actually curate in response to a theme? How do you, as a curator, add to the narrative around the contemporary human condition through the work that you present? Shivanjani, I may ask you to start with this. There are, you know, in the presentation, there are some very kind of strong ideas that you wanted to get across. Maybe you could just elaborate a bit on that and how this exhibition for you responds to the theme of being human. Yeah, I think um, for me, A Bell Rings Across the Valley is sort of exploring uh, this present moment, but using, I guess, the brown body to do that. And, but also like, um, is really critically sort of not upending this idea of what the brown body could look like. So it's not a perfect Bollywood, like young woman. It's actually like an old, like the, the, the image that you walk into when you enter into the exhibition is like of an older, like 76 year old, like old woman with her arms wide open, like being very, very cheeky. And, and I think that that sort of upends your expectation of what this person or this human could be um and and for me also like there is like there is the the exhibition also sort of speaks to vulnerabilities and and um the ideas around mental health but also what what are we allowed to say to each other um using both image as well as language yeah i think what's really interesting in all the exhibitions we're talking about is while they're kind of like immediately accessible there's beautiful images and you know something that people can relate to for many of the of the artworks they're actually a way to talk about deeper ideas to go much further and i think pippa that's interesting hoda's work you know you may ask why are we having an exhibition of photographs from these distant islands off the off the south coast of iran in a photography festival here in melbourne um, could you elaborate a bit on kind of some of the actual you know um ideas that are coming through in that work and how that connects to questions of, of humanity. Yeah, I, look, I think that a lot of this exhibition has to do with not explaining away through Western theories or through um, medical uh, ideas and um, explanations, something that is inherently mysterious and inherently human. Um, the, there's there's mystery and there's magic. Hoda speaks a lot about the magic that is present in this work and that sort of magic in, in the real world terms rather than the, in the slate of hand, slate of hand sort of terms. Um, and these photographs really look at the ways that you can seek to understand but also leave without understanding and just sit with an idea. And that is one of the most human things um, that we could do. It's an absolutely beautiful presentation. All these exhibitions connect with, with people and places around the world. And it's, it's fascinating to walk between them and see the kind of threads that, uh, uh, that people connect with. We are almost running out of time. If it's okay with the panelists, we might just continue a few minutes longer because there's just a few other ideas I think it'd be good to explore. Um, and one question that I get asked a lot um, and something that took a while for me to understand is what is the curator's role? Curator and curating 
seems to encompass a whole array of tasks and and roles and could end up in very different um, experiences for for audiences to view um, you know we have examples here of working with an archive of commissioning new work of bringing different artists work together um, and Pippa, while we haven't touched on it, the Monash Gallery of Arts also a collecting institution, so it works with their own collection. Would, um, would the, each of the panelists uh, kind of very briefly kind of summate for, for the audience what, what it means to be a curator in, in your understanding, your experience of that? Maybe, Cathy, we can, we can start with you. Sure. Well, listen, from my perspective, I suppose it's a, it's storytelling at, at its core. Um, so from my background, actually, um, my background is actually in social history research and I've come into curating through that avenue. So I see myself as the gatherer of stories and the interpreter of stories for the audience and providing platforms for the audience to experience those, those stories. So that's a very broad kind of definition of, of curating. Um, but of course, all those elements of research um, and selection come into that, um, which is crucial when you're, you're creating, you're, you're choosing what you're presenting and, and how you're presenting it in conjunction with, with designers and, uh, and other team members. So that would be my, my take on it. Thank you. Shivanjani, you began your presentation by say that you, you know, you're perhaps predominantly an artist and you curate sometimes. So what does it mean for you to be a curator and take on that role? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think like in many ways, um, when I curate, I'm thinking about my, my contribution to art history and I'm making it from a very centralized knowledge that's often Eurocentric um, and, you know, predominantly white. And so in curating, I'm sort of trying to platform artists artists of colour um, to, to um, have a platform, particularly in Australia, in a different way. And, and, you know, like I think one of the things that curating or like one of the genesis of that word is care. And like for me, it is definitely an act of care. And, I, um, and like one of the alternatives that I think about is in Hindi, the word for looking is deko. But if you say dekna, it's looking with care. And I think that that's something that I feel really like is a way that I approach curating particularly because um, so much of art making is very like ego and I'm, I'm looking for ways to not think about myself um, often. Fair enough, a chance to put other people in the spotlight. Pippa, for you, what, what does it mean to be a curator? What, what, what roles does that encompass? Uh, that's, it's so nice to hear these different points of view and I feel like I need to be making notes to tell my dad what curators do, he always <laughs> asks me. <laughs> um, and it, it, both of those answers are so, so true. It's about storytelling and it is about caring and, and looking. And I think that the other main thing that I'd add to that is that it's, it's about advocating. Um, you, I often feel like I'm there to be an advocate for the artist and to make sure that they are getting um, the best experience, what they want out of it, the show that will look the best but also sometimes corralling and sometimes um, making them see things that they might not know about the space or about the audience or about the way that you encounter their work in this particular instance. And then there's also being the advocate for the institution that you're working for. Um, and so MGA as both a collecting institution, as a city council gallery, as a public space that is always free to enter, there are a lot of different considerations that are sort of being put um, on that side of the scale as well. And so as a curator, I, and I kind of like this part of it, you often disappear as you just try to, to weigh up the different, um, the different priorities and the different, um, the different sort of agendas of the, of the, um, of the, the institutions or people that you're trying to bring together with an exhibition. And Brendan, what does it mean to curate photography in the public realm? What's the, what, what does that role involve? Yeah, I'll just, I've got a whiny dog next to me. So apologies if those sounds come through. Um, I start curating in the same way that, as Shivanjini said, that it comes back to the word care, but it also, as a curator for public space, I see myself very much as a conduit. I'm between the artist, the audience and the site. So 
to get something on the side of someone's building, you need their approval. You need the artist to want to put that space there as well. It's it's constant conversation of working out everyone's desires and what they're wanting to achieve from the presentation of the artwork. Um, but also alongside that, it's about thinking about how works can exist in the public space um, and how they can actually stand up on their own two feet because there's works that you can put in a gallery that are absolutely gorgeous, like stunning pieces, and then in the wrong context just wouldn't work in the space. And it's also still thinking about, even though we're on in these outdoor sites, thinking about how works still speak to each other because someone viewing Richmond's work at 99 Spring will still have that in their mind when they're walking across the road to look at a Tong's work. We'll still have that in their mind when they're going across the next spot. So it's important to make sure that work still work together despite the kind of larger space you're in. Thank you. And you've all implied it, but of course, behind the beautiful images and the, you know, putting work on walls or place it in a public space, there's also a huge amount of uh, production and administration that goes behind this. And maybe that's a conversation for another day. Um, <clears throat> Kathy, when you were speaking, you were talking about the public programs that are taking place alongside the, you know, the physical exhibition. And this, of course, is very, you know, quite common practice for um, for, for exhibitions to also have a public program a kind of talks or, or live element alongside the exhibited works. Why is that important for, for you as a curator to also have this kind of output? Well, I think it really um, extends the conversation. I mean, that's the, 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 the big thing that it does. I mean, in an exhibition space, we really were not trying to be didactic about what we wanted people to take away from the Helmut Newton exhibition. Um, and Newton can be controversial in terms of his imagery and how women's bodies in particular are portrayed. Um, and But we, we didn't want to be heavy handed about coming down one side or the other in, in that. I mean, people have their various viewpoints on his, on his work. Um, and so the exhibition is the chance for people to view that. And then the conversation continues with the programming. Um, that's the way I see it. Um, that it then gives people the opportunity to delve deeper into some of these aspects and not just those aspects that I mentioned, but other, you know, we're having a whole range of, of programming in, in line with this. Um, some of it to do with the um, Tatura experience in, in the camps as, um, as refugees. So, um, you know, it gives a chance to extend the research and extend those aspects of, of Helmut's life and output um, to, to give it another, another space for discussion. Great. <clears throat> and, um, you know, across Photo 2022, there's a varied events program, different exhibitions will have talks and panels, but also film screenings or dance performances that respond to the work, poetry readings and much more. Um, and all of this gets considered by the curators in the development of the exhibition. Now, just a final question for everyone. I think we've worked through all the other questions. Um, <clears throat> For someone that might be watching who might be at high school or uh, doing a graduate degree and is interested in um, starting a career in, uh, in creative photography or just curating an exhibition of photography, um, if we were to give them a bullet point list of things to think about or to do, and you could each add a bullet point to this list, what would it be? What should someone do or think about uh, to, uh, to start on this journey of curating? Pippa, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you since you have the most experience in curating for photography ex exhibitions specifically. What would you suggest uh, uh, someone, an emerging practitioner begins? I think the first thing you've got to do is constantly be visiting exhibitions. And then the second thing you have to do is just start. I remember saying to a, um, to a mentor years ago, I just want to make an exhibition, but make sure nobody sees it because I'm sure it'll be really bad. And she was like, we, well, you can't. So just make one. And then if people like it, they like it. And if they don't, they don't. And it can be small. It can be large. It can be in a friend's lounge room um, or it can be starting um, volunteering at an actual institution and trying to assist a curator and working in that way but just actually um getting in there and starting first I think, 
I think that's a really important point. An exhibition does not have to look like an exhibition in a gallery. An exhibition of photography could be many things. It could be put together in a very affordable way. It could be online. It could be, you know, as you say, in a living room, in, in, in a house. It could be in the windows of a, of a house. There are many ways to approach this. Shivanjani, over to you. What would you suggest a, a young person starting out in, in curating? What should they do? What should they do first? Or what should they think about? Well, I think they should be looking at art, like, and looking at exhibitions, because that gives you a sense of what you what what is possible. And I think also don't forget that an exhibition can be a singular image. You know, that's more than okay. Um, and in fact, like one of the things that I thought about a lot because I was working with so many communities not close by was, you know, we don't have to be overproductive. We can just make work that is a singular image and that can be enough um and that's yeah like uh, you don't have to go overboard it can be very very simple and i think that kind of editing is a really important role in a curator's work and something that many photographers and i'm i'm sure many people wouldn't mind me saying this many photographers find difficult is editing their own work and it's part of the curator's role to work with the photographer and think about what is actually important to show. And it might be less than, uh, than, than what might be originally thought of. We don't have to put every image on a wall to have an impact. Kathy, what should someone do? Yeah, listen, I would say, again, go and see as many exhibitions as you can and also um, have discussions with other curators um, and, and find mentors as well. I think that's really important about how to put an exhibition together um, and, um, you know, partnerships with, with whether it's galleries or other curators it is really valuable as well. Good advice. Brendan, what would you suggest? Um, the worst thing that someone can say is no. Um, I think that thinking about reaching out to people you've never met, um, that artists are people too. Even if you haven't met this person and you like, you really admire their work, like just don't be afraid to reach out. It doesn't even have to be for an exhibition, just like reach out to like, I really love your work. I'd love to know more about it. Like coffee with artists, getting to know different people so that things don't seem as intimidating. Great, more good advice. Can, I, can yeah. I just add from a really boring and um, sort of uh, administrational point of view, most institutions take volunteers um, and mm. that is how I started and it's a really great way to just see how something works and then move into different roles from there. That is also how I started. <laughs> That's also how I started. <laughs> Uh, while, while I'm sure we all appreciate that volunteering might not be an option for everyone, and really, if you have the ability to do it, even if it's, you know, an occasional day here or there, it's a great way of just kind of understanding how galleries operate and why they do, you know, why they do what they do and how they do it. Um, you can learn a lot through that kind of osmosis. Um, I will just also add, you know, get active. Nothing will teach you like, you know, about curating as much as actually curating an exhibition will. It doesn't have to be in a, in a gallery space. It could even just be a model. Imagine your, your, your fantasy exhibition, what works would you put in there? You can print off works from online and, and start thinking, what are the relationships that you would make? What are the stories that you would get across? And that I think is probably where we will end the conversation today. That just leaves me to thank Kathy, Pippa, Shivanjani and Brendan so much for your time and being so frank and uh, forthcoming with your, uh, with your experience and knowledge. I will urge people to see as many exhibitions as they can before Photo 2022 closes next Sunday, the 22nd of May. That said, a bell runs, rings across the valley and speak the wind are both on display until the 22nd, 26th of June, excuse me. So there is more time to see that. And Helmut Newton in focus is on, ex, it is on display at the Jewish Museum into 2023. So plenty of time to see those uh, exhibitions. But for now, thank you all so much and look forward to, to spending more time with the exhibitions and work on display. Have a very good day. Thank you.